What up, nerds? Jared Santo here with Changelog. I am just putting the finishing touches on a very special episode of the Changelog podcast all about Vim with some special guests such as Gary Bernhardt, whom you may know from WAT, Destroy All Software, and Execute Program. Gary was gracious enough to sit down and Vim with me for a few minutes just to give everybody a taste of what his Vim life is like. Take a look. So one thing that is maybe going to be not familiar to a lot of people, especially I would guess Windows users maybe, is that I run Vim in the terminal all the time. I don't even have a graphical Vim installed. So this is my Vim. And, you know, it starts and quits really fast. So I can just go in there and come back out all the time. Or I can go in there and open a file, like, just to see something on the screen. Wow, that was surprisingly slow. It was booting the... Backfire. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't Vim. That was the TypeScript language server booting. Gotcha. I can background this, Control Z, and then FG to come back to it. It's still running. I can run multiple Vims. So now I have two running. There they are. And this is all just normal Unix shell stuff. Mm-hmm. Vim doesn't know any of this is even happening to it. And so I don't need a bunch of terminal windows or a separate terminal pane or anything like that. I'll be in here. Maybe I make some changes. I want to commit them. I drop down. I do my git commands. And that's it. So that's quite different from a graphical editor that even if it embeds a terminal, the terminal is kind of like a second class citizen there. So you're not using your your Git commands inside of Vim with any sort of plugins, even from the colon prompt, like shelling out to Git, you're dropping to this all the time. A lot of the time. I might say like, Git check out this file if I want to throw away the changes I made. Or, you know, if I want to blame, you know, I'll do a Git blame. It's always you. You're always to blame. Yeah, good. It is always me. (laughs) Yeah, so Vim is deeply integrated with Unix in a way that graphical editors aren't. You know, I can do things like pipe the contents of a file through some terminal command. So, like, let's sort this code, which doesn't really make sense, but it'll do it. (laughs) And sometimes that is really useful. So it means that the better you get at the shell, the better you are at using Vim or Emacs, same story. And the better you get at Vim also will let you use your shell commands more. So there's like this reinforcing bi-directional kind of thing between them. And I, I value that a lot. That is awesome. So you showed me that sort. Walk us through that, that command that you did. So visual mode, then you highlighted some text. Yeah, what did I do? I probably hit shift V, that's line-wise visual mode. So I'm selecting whole lines. Right. And then I probably, I'm guessing I did 10J because I always jump by 10 and then probably K'd back up just because <laughs> I'm a programmer and I automatically want to select the whole inside of the function, but not the closing phrase. <laughs> there you go. And then what'd you do? So we have nine lines selected and I did colon bang. So Vim has automatically inserted these two markers, which just mean the visual mode selection. The bang means run a command. Right. I did sort, so that's a normal shell command. Right. And then Vim is going to pipe these lines into that shell command, and then whatever comes out of that command on standard out, it's going to replace these lines with that. So when I run this, there's our sorted lines and a bunch of type errors. Right. That's the same as like if I do A and B on separate lines piped into sort at the command line. Well, those are already sorted. That was a bad example. Um, <laughs> B and A. C and B. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there we go. So it turned that into BC. That's what Vim is doing. It's just a shell command. Right. So any command you have, regardless of how complex it is or where you got it, it'll work. So you can write your own scripts. You can call those from here. You can put the input from those into the script and the output can come back to Vim, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Full bidirectional communication. Yeah, that's cool. Just standard in, standard out. No weird APIs to implement. It's not like a language server where you have to use this special kind of interface. It's just text. Now, you also have your test suites pretty well harnessed into this. Do you mm-hmm. want to show me anything to do with that? Or what, what other stuff you do commonly? I do run tests a lot. So if we open the test file, this is a little bit squished, of course, because I'm on a small screen here. Mm-hmm. But my enter key runs the tests. You know, I run tests a lot, and <laughs> I want to be able to do that quickly. So enter is about as quick as it gets. And that background's Vim and takes you back to the terminal, right? Yeah, it's just running a shell command the same way that I was running the sort, except for it's not going to capture the output or anything like that. So it's kind of like if we did like sleep for three seconds and echo OK and sleep for one more second. Vim's just going to run that command and wait for it to finish. There's the OK. And now Vim is waiting for us to say we've looked at the output and we want to go back. Gotcha. So that's basically all it's doing when I hit enter. I mean, if we actually look at that... There's a fair bit of complexity here. This is all test running stuff, but it's because it supports all kinds of different things. Like I've got some Ruby stuff in here and special bundler exceptions. And here's a old Python one. That's what all that's for. So you've built this up over years as you've used different languages and been in different jobs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Many, many years. And, you know, extensions for for certain sort of edge cases. Like it can tell if I'm in a test file, I added that at some point. Somewhere in here, there's something to run the test on a certain line, which only works in our spec but I had to add that. 
And, you know, if you've never seen VimScript and you glance at it, like, I'm not a VimScript fan, but mm -hmm. it's just a programming language, basically. It's got ifs and stuff, and you can figure it out. <laughs> cool. Anything else that's noteworthy? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of stuff that is, but it's hard to call off the top of your head. That being said, whatever you can think of that is visual or interesting or maybe abnormal. A couple things. So my weird tab key thing, if I'm like right here where I am on this line, let's say I'm at the beginning of the line, my tab key indents like you would expect. But mm -hmm. then if I start typing a word and hit tab, it'll auto-complete. And it's actually auto-completing from all the files I have open, which is just this one and I think only my vimrc. And this is just built into vim. The normal keystroke would be control P, does the same thing. And control N and control P sort of go through the list. But I really like vim's auto-complete because it doesn't know the language. This is not like a language server thing. All it's doing is tokenizing every open file and just finding words that start with the letters I typed, U-N-D. And that means it works everywhere. You don't need special language support. So if you're writing some weird configuration language or whatever, if you're in a JSON file, if you're writing English text, it will happily autocomplete words. You know, so if I'm like in some text file and I have, you know, one sentence and then another sentence, I can autocomplete the word sentence. Hmm. And I do that automatically because I've had this tab key set up like this for so many years that even in English text, I'm auto-completing longer words all the time. And it's just nice to have that sort of uniformity between code and text. I like that because probably like 85 to 90% of the time, the word I'm trying to auto-complete is already right here in this file somewhere. Like it's mm -hmm. often a variable that I've just named somewhere else and now I'm trying to use that variable. So the fact that it's not using language support doesn't really bug you, huh? It doesn't really come back to bite you very often. <laughs> All things being equal, I would probably also like to have good language-based completion because obviously right. this is not going to help me when I say we have a candidate function here. If I call candidate, it's not going to tell me what's there, <laughs> right. what it takes. And I would probably like to have that, but it's a trade-off you make. And you can get that, by the way. I don't have that set up, but you can get it depending on your language. There certainly is TypeScript support for that kind of stuff. Very cool. Anything else you got? I do have the sort of normal language support that you would have. This is TypeScript that we're looking at. And I have stuff like, you know, let's say this variable is inferred to be a number because it's a subtraction of two numbers. So if I say that's a string, it's going to type error. And I can jump between them. You can see the error message appearing at the bottom left there, whatever error my cursor is under. Sometimes people assume that you can't get that kind of stuff in an old editor like Vim, but you can. You can get even jump to definition. Can we jump to the length of a string? Yeah, we totally can. So this is like deep in the TypeScript standard library types where it defines the, you can see Windows new lines there. That's what those say, are. <laughs> it's written in Windows. <laughs> yep, yep, because it's Microsoft. Yep, that's what the M stands for, is Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, M for Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can jump around to the definition of anything, including into the standard library. So you can get most of the modern niceties that you want, including smart completion, but it's never going to be quite as deep as a language-specific editor or IDE. So is that just part of the TypeScript language support, or is there a TypeScript plugin that you have that enables that? Or That was actually a few different plugins, believe it or not. There is not one sort of omnibus plugin. So let's see, what do we have here? Well, you can see I've commented them. That's highlighting and indenting. This is jumping to definition. Tsukuyomi jumps to definition and does some other similar kinds of stuff. And then ale is asynchronous linting something or other. <laughs> that is what handles errors showing up, the sort of red underline kind of thing. Gotcha. So it's a bit more complex than what you would have to do in VS Code, but this is it, you know, these three. You just say, mm -hmm. I want to use these plugins. I'm using this plugged plugin manager, and it all just more or less works. Awesome. Well, thanks, Gary. I appreciate you showing us around. I'm happy to do it. So there you have it, a quick peek into Gary's Vim life. He has a lot more to say about it, Here's a preview from the podcast. Vim is the best text editor that anyone ever wrote that was widely used. But I mean that in a, in a more narrow way than it probably sounds. So every editor is going to be good at something, right? There's a reason that every editor was written. Even like Nano was written because it's small and easy to install, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so if you want to spend your whole career customizing an editor to match you exactly, you probably want Emacs. If you want really deep, language support with automated refactorings and debuggers and all that, you probably want a full-on IDE. If you want a text editor that is extremely efficient at editing text and maybe not quite as good at some other things as other editors might be, then Vim is the best solution for that. And there's really not any kind of runner up for, for editing efficiency, unless it's something that it looks a lot like Vim um, or is very, very esoteric. 
follow the link in the description to listen to the entire episode. In addition to Gary, you will hear from Drew Neal, Julia Evans, and Sue Hinton. Cheers.